Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion, the off-season edition, continuing now from May the 2nd, 2016. It won't be long until it becomes just the regular old Hurricane Outlook and discussion, hopefully better than ever, though, uh, as the East Pacific hurricane season begins here in about 13 days, May 15th. And then, of course, the Atlantic Basin hurricane season starting, at least on the calendar, on June the 1st. So let's start the tour off today with a look at sea surface temperature anomalies. You can tell rather easily in the Pacific that the cooling continues very cold here near the Galapagos Islands relative to average. And that coolness starting to really snake its way through the tropical Pacific, cooling off as predicted by most of the models, maybe a little faster than some of them were thinking, if models could think, I guess. Looking at the Atlantic Basin, boy, this area has certainly warmed up in the recent weeks. Uh, the Caribbean and Gulf, nice and warm compared to average. But then we still have this cold area up in the farther reaches of the North Atlantic. And there is some speculation that this could work its way down uh, with the Canary Current especially. And then the westerly trajectory, the winds coming from the east towards the west, is, so I should call them easterlies. The easterly trades would sort of mix this in and cool off the MDR here, the main development region, but that hasn't happened yet. And so if we go back and look at the wider shot, when you have a colder Pacific and a warmer Atlantic, usually the Atlantic's going to be busier than the Pacific. And even up here in the areas north of uh, sort of the Pacific main development region, if you want to call it that, this water cooling off as well. So interesting things coming into play that sort of suggest you know, that the season for the Atlantic could be busier than we have seen in recent years and maybe, just maybe, quite a bit busier. So, yeah, I don't want to go too far deep into that because there's still a lot that can happen, as we know, but we're starting to see some signs that things could be changing for this year. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. One of those, of course, is the oncoming La Nina, or the colder episode here, the Enso State. We have this one small island of warmth left in this ocean of cold. And a pretty good analogy for Monday, wouldn't you say? And you look at these uh, temperature gradients in here, we're talking about five different shades of blue. One, two, three, four, five, and might even be a six little small nugget right there. Uh, basically, that translates to quite a bit colder than it should be. And if you remember this chart, in recent months, it was filled with very warm anomalies that extended all over the place, filled in with uh, basically all the colors on the right-hand side of the scale, and that has certainly flipped, and it's basin-wide, too. That really impresses me, uh, all the way over from the west coast of South America, extending westward uh, to 140, 160 degrees east longitude, way over in the western Pacific. So once all of this starts to really surface this cold water, the La Nina will be coming on in sort of brute force, and that can have a big impact on the Atlantic season, to be sure. Looking at actual sea surface temperatures, the Gulf of Mexico, the 80 degree line, or 26 degrees Celsius, we call that an isotherm, line of equal temperature. This is the outline of it, as I'm doing here in red. Finally, the shelf water uh, along most of the Florida Peninsula and areas close to shore from there warming up nicely as is the case here along most of the Texas waters the rest of the Gulf the northern Gulf Coast up here is slowly getting there so eventually you can get in the water and you won't need a wetsuit I myself I like the water to be about 82 to 85 and I can go in and enjoy it any colder than that and it's just not as pleasant but other people 75 and up and they're happy and it's getting there looking at the western Atlantic this too warming up as you would expect and again some areas warmer than they should be but for now just kind of showing you the pattern uh, here's the 26 degrees Celsius uh, and, and that's important in case you didn't know that's roughly the temperature that tropical storms and hurricanes need 26 C or about 79 and a half Fahrenheit and that's starting to edge its way into the shot here the Gulf Stream outlined pretty nicely through the Atlantic and then, of course, you have the colder water to the north and west from there. As you would expect, that's just the way that the patterns set up in the ocean and the geography of the region. 
it won't be too long you'll be able to get in the water uh, looking at this down here for example 21 degrees Celsius down towards Myrtle Beach and uh, so you're talking about low 70s that's not too bad still about 10 degrees colder than I like it so when might we expect something to happen as I mentioned the eastern Pacific season officially gets underway May the 15th and then two weeks later the Atlantic season and now we're in the time frame where we can start to look at some of the long-range guidance as fuzzy as it may be and a lot of it is just large pieces of puzzles that you try to put together and see if maybe conditions will be favorable and one of those is the Madden Julian oscillation or what we call the MJO here and this is from the GFS and its ensemble members and essentially if you see the MJO activity kind of way out on the chart like this then it's what we call highly amplified or a strong MJO signal is another way to put it and as you can clearly see in recent weeks it's been rather weak to what we call incoherent or non-existent a very weak MJO signal meaning that there has not been wide-scale upward motion and upward motion helps to lead to tropical convection where the thunderstorms go up in the atmosphere without sinking air or shear but mainly the sinking air you have to have this divergence aloft in the atmosphere where the air is going up and spreading out so that you can foster this tropical thunderstorm development and the MJO is a nice way to track that and as you can see it's been fairly non-existent around the globe all these different regions uh, over the last couple of weeks and it's not forecast to amplify much at all even after the next couple of weeks and the euro the ECMWF and its ensemble members here showing the same kind of thing maybe a bit of an amplification towards the Indian Ocean area uh, in the, the middle part of May we'll see but this is one of the things one of the tools that we can utilize once the season gets going and we can try to figure out when we might have these windows of opportunity for something to develop it's a great guidepost it's not the uh, solution to figuring out what we call tropical cyclogenesis or the birth of tropical storms and hurricanes perfectly but it helps us sort of have a uh, a little bit of an advantage to see if the large-scale pattern supports it and if it does then we can start looking at more details from there hopefully that makes sense and as I mentioned, the East Pack season getting ready to start. And as such, the climatological maps start to come into play. Points of origin for all tropical storms and hurricanes from May 10th through the 20th. So roughly the second third of the month. Almost equal to what we have seen in the Atlantic Basin during that same time frame. So I kind of I talked about this last year and probably the year before that. Why doesn't the hurricane season for both basins here begin on May 15th just even it all out instead of one on May 15th and the other one on June 1st I mean we can count them up one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five six seven eight they're equal so why not have both seasons start at the same time it doesn't matter I guess it's just weird right so you folks on the Pacific side uh, you got to get ready, you know, whatever it takes. You had a bad season last year in some of these areas. And in 14, 2014, it was farther up the coast. And you just never know. It could be active if the water off here cools a little bit more. Maybe it won't be quite as bad. But it's almost that time. So interests along the Pacific coast of Mexico, be ready. Uh, hurricane season is fast approaching. So let's switch from the tropics to lower 48 weather nothing really major going on uh, outside of oh, we've had some flooding certainly down here along parts of the Gulf Coast uh, especially in Louisiana recently some areas of eastern and southeastern Texas nothing like we had around what we call tax day remember that April 17th 18th something like that uh, pretty bad flooding historic in some areas around the Houston area it's been more of a nuisance um, hit and miss kind of thing large hail though definitely still been in the news with some of these storms but as you can see from the radar widely scattered over a large geographic area but no one major storm system with life-threatening severe weather coming with it on a large scale what we call a high impact event now that being said any one of these thunderstorm complexes and heavy rain as a whole can certainly be disruptive for you locally 
but we don't have a major severe weather outbreak pending and we can see that on the SPC Storm Prediction Center day one outlook the highest potential of severe weather in the Piedmont and parts of the mountainous areas of the Carolinas well really specifically North Carolina eastern Tennessee a good deal of western parts of Virginia and a thin strip of eastern West Virginia uh, generally speaking this region in here more favorable than anywhere else in the country right now for severe weather but even that is a fairly low probability if we go look at the rest of the week real quick you can see even tomorrow that shifts eastward but the probabilities come down just a little bit again no major severe weather outbreaks coming which is good the pattern just doesn't support that right now I'll show you that and explain why in just a moment and finally by day three the peninsula of Florida has the highest chance but even that is just marginal very low overall widely scattered areas of severe weather and finally remember this goes all the way out to eight days day four day five and through day six seven and eight the predictability and the probability overall too low for severe weather anywhere in the country and that's good because after all it's May and we know especially out in this region how active things can get and the reason for the most part why we're not seeing much happening let's take a look at the GFS at the 500 millibar level 18 20,000 feet in the atmosphere and uh, this is where we can see the contours if you will of the jet stream steering pattern troughs and ridges and as you can see as the next few days progress big cutoff low over the east so kind of cool rainy you know unsettled but nothing severe and then a very large cutoff low out here over the Great Basin and parts of the western United States and some minor ridging in between those two areas of low pressure in the middle parts of the atmosphere I'll let it run again and as you can see a little bit of energy dives in but we don't have anything major coming in no deep troughs with a lot of energy butting up against deep tropical moisture coming out of the Gulf and therefore things should stay pretty quiet severe weather wise all right well before I go I want to give you three tips bullet points if you will get a sip of water still battling a cold that I got at the last part of March luckily it hasn't completely sacked me but it's still annoying all right so hurricane seasons coming up and we got to start talking preparedness and I know for a lot of people that's boring and I understand that in fact I'm doing a blog on this that I'll publish tomorrow on hurricanetrack.com so let me just give you sort of three bullet points on easy preparedness thoughts all right the very first thing you should do is assess your vulnerability how vulnerable am I my family my business me individually to tropical cyclone impacts mainly storm surge flooding and the possibility of having to evacuate because of that you can find this out by talking to your local emergency management office or your local planning office press 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 ask until you get answers look at maps try to understand what your vulnerability is and should you need to evacuate and from there you can develop a plan if you know what your vulnerability is that's a great starting point the second thing you need to do based on that in some part certainly is to look at your insurance situation your automobile your home your business your boat things of that nature stuff that if the hurricane or tropical storm destroys or severely damages that you want to have replaced or repaired some stuff you might say yeah whatever but a majority of it you're going to want back better than it was before maybe you know certainly as good as it was before in many instances right and the way to do that is through insurance but you have to have the right insurance the proper coverage and you need to plan all of that ahead of time do not leave it to chance and don't wait until one of these things is knocking on your door here once you see the eye coming for you on a map it's time's up you've already it's too late at that point especially when we're talking about flood insurance investigate all of that now it'll save you a lot of stress later finally talk about it with your family if it's just you living by yourself okay might be a little easier and again though you can still talk to your family away from where you live about what you're gonna do call up mom and dad aunts uncles friends you know whoever tell them hey yeah you know what if we're gonna have a category so-and-so in in my area I'll probably be leaving and I'm gonna to go to Fred's house or whatever you know talk about it 
sit down around the dinner table, order a pizza. Hey, guys, we're going to talk about hurricanes today. I bet, especially in families with kids, you got somebody who's the next, you know, Jim Cantori or John Hope, uh, you know, from the Weather Channel. Remember him? He was fantastic. Brian Norcross. You name it. Somebody who's a big weather icon and, uh, you know, loves it. And you got somebody in your family probably that's like that. Let them handle tracking and let them sort of take the lead on that. A grade school kid all the way up through high school and college, of course. Embrace that. Uh, being a weather nerd is not a bad thing, put it that way, and that can really help you. So, you know, sit around the family uh, dinner time and talk about hurricanes, what you're going to do, where we're going to go, how we're going to do things, who's going to be responsible for what. And it helps. Every little bit of this helps every step of the way. And um, doing all those three things is a great start. It's not the solution to all of your hurricane problems because, my goodness, we live in a world of very busy schedules. We all have a lot going on, a lot of stuff, and oh, it's just it's so different for everybody that there is definitely not a one-size-fits-all hurricane planning strategy. But those three things, I think, can be a good starting point, all right? So with that, uh, those three cents worth, if you will, usually it's two cents, but I gave you an extra penny for today. Uh, have a good one the rest of your Monday. I do appreciate it, as always, that you tune in and listen to these ramblings as I talk about my favorite subject. Uh, but I do want you to be ready because they can be very miserable events. You get through the storm itself, but then the aftermath is what's really obviously the lingering misery, and we don't want that for anybody. We want you to be able to come back and enjoy these videos that I produce without too much hassle, right? Right. Have a good rest of your week, and as always, like I said before, thanks for tuning in. I'm Mark Sutteth for HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll talk to you next Monday.